Wow, wow, what a turn of events, guys. I have plenty of comments regarding that endgame. Um, and I don't need Stockfish um, to at least give my thoughts on that. So let me start with the start of the game, which I didn't actually catch. I only tuned in once we got to the end game. Oh, and unfortunately, okay, so it says hit my keyboard arrow keys. Okay, so that does work. So we have the ever-exciting Exchange Slav. Um, the Four Knights Exchange Slav. Yeah. I'm not going to go into this opening in any detail. In part because my friends who actually know the Slav have contempt for um, people who routinely do this sort of thing where you just play exactly what your opponent plays and his Peter's out to a draw very quickly. So it looked like um, both sides were playing just for a draw out of the opening. Well, no. I'm sorry. It looked like white was playing for a draw. And black was playing for something a bit more ambitious. And um, because of that, black was taking some risks. And now white has an advanced pawn on the queen side. I'm actually going to ignore the opening and middle game then. And go straight to this rook end game. This, at this point, this is quite tricky. Um, this requires some very good calculation, but I think the key principle here is that white needs to activate his king and that black's rook is more active and that, that the active rook will compensate um, for white's advanced pawn, if not help black actually win it. Now keep in mind, if these pawns on the queen side get exchanged, if you trade off all these pawns, and with or without the rooks being traded, five on four is a draw. And, it, well, okay. Is five on four a draw? And now I'm questioning myself. I don't think it's necessarily a draw. Um, but it would be, it, it would be a draw if white's pawns were further advanced. Um, but if black has more space, um, yeah, so white actually needs to be careful that he doesn't lose both of these pawns for this one, because this resulting endgame might not be drawn after all. Black could, uh, would have pretty good practical chances for winning, even if it's not a theoretical win, which I'm not sure about. Yeah, giving up the C file, I don't like that at all. I would much prefer to see a move like Rook C2. Um, something that hampers White's king, ties it down to the first rank. Um, and then maybe later Rook B2. But Rook B3 right away, I don't like that at all. We'll see after the game what Stockfish thinks, but yeah, I think... Um, the Llama Lord was correct to take this opportunity and activate his rook on the open C file. Oh, 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 oh. No, you have to use all your pieces. The king is a fighting piece in the endgame. Um, I guess unless the tactics mandate that you play this, try to avoid doing it. But maybe... Wow. Is there any answer to this threat of rook c6 to rook a6? That's a really strong threat. Um, and if black dawdles, and if he plays like king d6 or plays king d7, well, it just plays rook c6, rook a6 anyway. That's a huge problem. Um which might even tactically justify that this rook b3 is way premature. Black's king is too far from the queen side. White's pawns are too far advanced. And that this is highly risky. 
I'll check with Stockfish after the game, but wow. Um, yeah, that's a quite unexpected turn. A huge shift in evaluation if I'm right. So yeah, White takes the pawn. Um, I don't know if Rook A7 or A7 is stronger here. I mean, normally I'd guess a7, but you're allowing Black's rook to a6 uh, troubles me somehow. No, but a7 looks fine. Yeah, and White's on pace to just move his king over and not fall for the tactical shot he fell for during the game, which is unfortunate for White, but... Like, here's another exercise. Like, white can gain a tempo playing king c5 to king c6, king b7, and so on. He does this thing that you call shouldering the king. So rather than allow black's king to d6, white should go like either to c5, c6, and b7, or c5 and take the pawn. Or c5 and say, I don't know, black pushes, you take on there, and take, take. And you can always go back and promote this later. Um, but if your goal is to move the king to b7, if that's your only goal, still go toward the center to do it. There's no penalty in moving this way, because this rook check to c2 just isn't punishing at all. So instead we have rook king b5, king e6. And here white has another chance to play king c6. And white misses this chance, and now things get start to get complicated. Um, but even here, white just plays rook takes f7. Yeah, so black took a gamble here, and it totally paid off. So that was interesting. No, 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 you're not... I mean... A lot of players would be tempted to fall for this sort of thing. I've played many a tournament game where I've just missed things outright. And because of that, including one especially embarrassing loss that I'm not even going to talk about, um, because of that, I learned that, you know, I can't relax until... Um, there's just no way for me to lose this. But uh, if there's any danger in the position, I, I don't relax at that point. Yeah, I mean, you see it, and you'll see it in one variation, you see it in another variation, and eventually the position comes up, and then you just miss it. I mean, that happens. This is a psychological thing. Right. So, I mean... Aside from the psychological thing about you don't want to um, relax before the game's over, even if you can't help that, um, and maybe that is the whole thing. Um, but I stress, like, every time I try to teach people anything about chess, I repeatedly stress, always try to figure out what your opponent's up to. And... Maybe it is just a psychological block, and these sorts of mistakes and blunders happen from time to time because you get careless. And that's just a human thing. Um, I mean, chess is a game. Chess is fun. It's a little bit upsetting when this sort of thing happens, but um, I wouldn't fault anybody for being human here. Um, and a great many of my wins have come from positions where I've been lost and my opponent walks into some silly tactic like this. Yeah. And I guess you don't have that same sort of tension just looking at a computer screen as you have um, in an actual tournament situation or over the board contest of any sort where you have a physical person there using a chess clock, you have the board in front of you with actual pieces on it, and pieces set off to the side, and there's like no distractions there. Um, 
Whereas playing from the comfort of your own home, just looking at a computer screen, it's hardly the same thing. Um, it's really easy to relax, especially when you forget that you have an opponent right over there who's doing everything they can. Um, so that's it. I gave my thoughts about what I thought happened in this endgame. Um, I'll blunder check my analysis with the computer. Um, so for those of you who can't see uh, the evaluation graph, let me just briefly scroll my browser so you can at least see that. Um, let's see, is this count on screen? Yeah. So there's a turning point right here around move 43. Um, but I'm not actually curious about that particular point in the end game. Um, so yeah, I said this is an exchange slav. It didn't look like especially much was going to happen. Um, what black needs to do is activate his king, get his king over to take those pawns. And while black's doing that, he can also play a move like rook c2 and keep the king tied off such that white really can't do anything and black is more or less going to win a pawn over here. But while black manages to win a pawn, uh, white can activate his rook and maybe take a pawn somehow and pose black some serious problems. But this looks far from easy. Um, yeah, I think this is the most instructive point in the game. Um, this being the point where black just moves... <laughs> I'm going to say he moved a piece twice in the opening, just because I'm going to say that this is like... I don't know. I'm... I'm saying that in jest, really, but he moved the same piece twice, really more than twice, and this piece isn't especially, well, it's not immediately threatening anything. It does stop white from pushing b6, I guess, or from pushing a5, but really, you need to use the king to stop those advances. This rook isn't going to do it by itself. Or, if you want to stop a5 that badly, just play rook c5. Um, yeah, Stockfish likes king d6. I personally like king d7. Whatever. Um, in this position, it might not be that important. But no, king d6 actually makes more sense. It's closer to the center. Um, and it's no farther from the corner and from c7 and all that. So yeah, king d6 is probably best. Rook c1, a very well calculated move here. And here black starts falling apart, really. But he's already down one pawn, effectively, because um, white's going to play rook c6, rook a6, um, and just it's going to be a nightmare for black to defend it. So black decides to put all his eggs in one basket and hope that white blunders this somehow. Um, yeah, I don't at all like king f6 either. Um, black really needs to play king d6 to stop these pawns. This rook by itself isn't enough to stop them. So, in the last few moves, black has played some things that probably caused white to take down his guard and not really be concerned about what's going on. So, either that's a psychological play that's deliberate, or he's just kind of pressured. Um... Anyway, so yeah, there we got a7, king d2, king c3, um, king b4. Um, and I was kind of curious what the computer thought of my ideas. Yeah, so, yeah, the computer's fine with what I was looking at then. Yeah, king b5 and king c5 are equally good, and the rest is history. <laughs>